Seems like a fitting Sunday to speak about love as the nation celebrates our mothers. I believe probably the most perfect examples of this biblical, unselfish, agape love are exhibited, number one, in Christ, number two, in our mothers. The love they have for us unselfishly, the love that they exhibit for us even when we talk back. I know eventually my mother will be watching this lesson. And even though we are so far away, I know that she unselfishly loved me because there were days I did not deserve to be loved. I remember there were days that I would talk back to my mother and she would simply look at me and say, you wait till your dad gets home. <laughs> Those weren't good days. Those were long days. But I know in those words now, being a parent myself, I know in those words she meant, I love you. Love is an interesting concept, and it's one that, I'll be honest, I have a hard time grasping completely. It's been so misused and so overused that oftentimes when we go back to the biblical definition of love, we find ourselves a little confused. We find ourselves in a situation where we try to tie in the world's idea of love simply to misunderstand God's concept of love. Sometimes it's hard for us to take a word that we use to simply describe our liking of anything to an unselfish love in which we choose to do daily. I want to look at a very familiar passage of Scripture this morning, one that we've all looked at before, one that Gary used during the Lord's Supper. We read the first three verses here a minute ago. In our greatest commands, we sing parts of it. But have we looked at 1 Corinthians 13 in the light of it being an unselfish love that daily we choose to do. An unselfish love that each day we awaken, we choose to love that way. It's interesting when you break down 1 Corinthians 13, and this morning I'd like to break it down in four different parts that I've used the letter D to help us get through it. First, the drive of love. Second, the definition of love. Third, the durability of love. And fourth, the distinction of love. The drive of love. What motivates us to love? When you think about the people in our life that we love, what motivates us to love them? You see, the church in Corinth was in dire need of a lesson on love. They were all confused about who they were and what their role was in the church. There were those who were divided. If you go back to the very beginning of 1 Corinthians, they were divided over who baptized them. They were divided over who taught them, and they began following men as some followed Paul and some followed Apollos. There was those who had sin that were tearing apart the congregation as you had a son sleeping with his father's wife. You had a church that was divided on opinion and idea. They were torn apart in many different areas. And Paul uses the 13th chapter or this section of the letter as we understand that there wouldn't have been chapter divisions in the original letter, but this section of the letter to define what love was. Listen, Corinth. If love was the driving factor, if this unselfish love was part of your character, you would not be divided over who baptized you. If love was your defining character and you chose to love unselfishly, son, you wouldn't be sleeping with your father's wife. 
You wouldn't be divided over this opinion, and you definitely wouldn't be eating food offered to idols if that was going to cause a stumbling block with your brother. When you gather to take the Lord's Supper, you would do it together. You wouldn't be dividing and doing such a thing. You wouldn't be doing it frivolously, definitely. Paul says in chapter 9, if this love was your motivating factor, it was your driving force, then you would become all things to all men in order to save some. And I look at the church today and I say, man, what lessons for us in our world today? As we look at this concept of this love that drives us, is this unselfish agape love a love that drives you? That causes you to use words that you use? Does this unselfish agape love that we see written for us in the pages of the New Testament, a love that drives our every action? Is it a love that drives us to give one another the benefit of the doubt? As we look at the perfect example of Christ, in his love, in his driving force. So let's work through this. If love motivated the church in Corinth, there would be no divisions created based on who they follow. If this unselfish love motivated them, sons would not be sleeping with their father's wives. If this unselfish love motivated them, one brother would not be suing another brother. If they chose to have this agape unselfish love, they wouldn't be puffed up or conceited because of knowledge. If this agape unselfish love motivated them, they would not eat food offered to idols as to cause one to stumble. If this unselfish love motivated them, they would always seek good in their neighbors. If this unselfish love they chose to motivate them, they would not think too highly of themselves because of the gifts they had, but rather think of themselves individual members of one body. If this love that they chose motivated them, According to 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 14, Paul says love would motivate them in all that they did. When we look at the church in Corinth, we can see this stark resemblance of people today. You see, I'm convinced whenever you get a, <coughs> excuse me, a number of people together, there's going to be differences. That's what makes us great. That's what 1 Corinthians 12 makes the church great because we're all different. We all have different gifts and different abilities that add to this idea of one unified body striving after the one unified goal of bringing Christ to people. But when we choose divisions, selfishness over love, we fail. So let me present it this way. The unselfish love that we desire, according to the very last verse of chapter 12, is the more excellent way. It is the way in which we function. It is the way in which we were designed to function but daily we wake up choosing to live this way. When we choose to live unselfishly, when this love drives us, listen to me, we will not be divided based on who baptized us, where we went to college, how we vote, what side of town we live on, or the color of our skin, because we are all equally loved by the same Father. Remember, Unselfish love is choosing to do what's best for others. When we love this way, we will unselfishly love our neighbors as ourselves. And our neighbors include 
our brothers and sisters in this building this morning. And if I love my neighbor, I won't betray him by sleeping with their spouse, by talking behind their back, by causing divisions within the church. Remember, this unselfish love is choosing to do what's best for each other. When we choose this love, we will be aware of the weaker brother and purposefully not do things to cause them to stumble. We will seek the good of each other. We will want each other to succeed. We will see the value in each other, and we will not believe we can do it alone, but we will seek help from each other, knowing each other has value. This type of love, when we choose to love with this unselfish love, the world will know we are Christians. They will see us and they will see us different. We won't look like the rest of the world, but we will look like Christ, the greatest example of the one who loves unselfishly. So when you look at this first section of 1 Corinthians 13, we look at this idea of the drive of love and within the context of 1 Corinthians 13, they had this conflict that some were doing and partaking of the gifts they had, but they weren't doing it in love and their, their love wasn't the drive behind it. Maybe the drive was popularity. Maybe the drive was power. Maybe the drive was, hey, look at me. And look at the great gift I have. But as we read this morning, those things done without love are simply a noisy symbol or a clanging gong. They're just simply annoying. Every time I read that, I think of a young child who just received a drum set for Christmas and they're practicing in your living room. And it doesn't really make any sound. It's just banging and clamoring and noise. And it's annoying. And every parent who's ever bought your child a drum set quickly realizes it wasn't the wisest of decisions. If we are doing things without this drive of love, it's simply annoying. And it doesn't go along with the line of how God designed these things to happen. So he carries on, and not only does he give us the drive of love, but as we work down through the text, he gives us the definition of love. Oftentimes we look at love as a verb. It's an active word. But Paul uses it more like a noun. Paul uses this word love and he follows it by is. Love is this or love is not this. It's more of how we're doing it as opposed to what we're doing. It's more of the choice to do it because of our love for each other as opposed to I have. To do it. We've all been there before where a mother looks at their child and says, now you're to kiss and make up. You ever watch two siblings kiss and make up? Go hug your brother. Oh. We've all seen that. Go give your brother a kiss. Oh, mom. You see the difference in doing that as opposed to seeing a brother or a sister after not seeing them for a long time and you welcome a sweet embrace? There's a difference in how we love. And Paul uses this idea of this agape love and clearly defines it for us. He says love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It's not full of itself. It's not arrogant or rude, love is all about others. Remember, it's this unselfish love. 
Let me ask a question for you to ponder as I ask it rhetorically. Is selfishness something that keeps us from loving biblically? Is our desire for self, our own wants, what we want, To make sure we get ours, does it keep us from loving unselfishly? Because if I go through these first defining factors again, it is patient, kind, does not envy or boast, it is not arrogant or rude, it does not insist on its own way. It's not puffed up. It's not full of self. It's how can I do for others? Do we wake up in the morning and say, today I choose to do for others. Today I choose to love unselfishly. Today I will wake up and I will serve my neighbor. Well, I had these plans. But now somebody needs my help. Today, I will choose to cancel my plans to help my brother, my sister, my neighbor. You ever been late somewhere and you pass somebody on the side of the road changing a tire? Today, I will choose to stop and change the tire. No, I know I want to go home. It's been a long day at work. All I want to do is go home and sit down. But my son has baseball practice. All right. I'm going to go. And I'm going to be the example I need to be for him and for the other players. You just get home from work and it's a long day. And your brother or sister in Christ calls and says, I really need somebody to talk to. Can you come over? What is your response? Is it, I'm on my way? Or is it, it's been a long day. Maybe you should call somebody else. Love is unselfish. This love that God has defined for us does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things. Love hopes all things, and love endures all things. Love never fails, which brings us to the third D. If we have the definition of love and we know that the love should drive us naturally, we must look at the third item, the durability of love. What is certain in this world? Uncertainty, right? You've heard that before. The only thing certain is uncertainty because things change. Things pass away, things stop. Things don't exist any longer. We have Christ in the Sermon on the Mount telling us to not lay by in store where what? Rust and a moth destroys, where thieves break in and steal. Because we have all of these things that we seem to want to hold on to. We seem to want to make our priority. We seem to invest in. They become so important to us, those things. And they just seem to go away. Specifically, as we get into this idea of the durability of love, he tells us these three gifts that he mentions back in chapter 12, these will cease. Because you see, in Corinth, they were looking at these three gifts as those are the important ones. If you have this gift, you are the man. 
If you have this gift, then you are the guy that everybody wants to be. Therefore, it gave them pride. And it was not fair for those who didn't have that gift. But he says what in verse 9? He says, or verse 8, love never ends. As for prophecies, that's the gift of the prophecy. They will pass away. As for the gift of tongues, it will pass away. As for knowledge, it will cease. But the durability of love lasts. He continues on and tells us when they will cease. In verse 9, he says, For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When the partial prophecies that you're receiving, these things will pass away. When what? The complete word of God is given. When the word of God is here and we have this written for us and we nicely have it organized for us and we have it all complete in front of us, we don't need the partial anymore because we have the complete. The entire word of God. These will pass away, he says. He says in verse 11, when I was a child, I spoke like a child and I thought like a child. And I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I gave up childish ways. You ever seen those commercials where they, they dub in kids' voices to adults? Uh, there's a, I think it's like a gummy bear commercial. And they're all sitting around a conference table. Some of you are going, yeah, we've seen that commercial. And it's like dubbed in these adults and they're, they're talking like children. And they're acting like children. And it's hilarious for us because it's so ridiculous. Because that's what happens, isn't it? When we become grown, we give up childish ways. We stop drinking milk and we start eating steak. We stop doing these things and we start maturing. Because that's what changes. Our childish ways pass away. We understand that. Paul uses it here as an illustration for us to understand. Listen, these three gifts, prophecy, knowledge, and tongue, they will pass away, but love has the durability that says it is eternal. God is love. This love, this unselfish love is eternal. There's a commercial on the radio right now talking about investing in gold because it lasts. And it's a safe investment because it's something tangible. You can hold it and you can grab it. And it's in part of the commercial. It says you can put it in your safe. Even gold is not eternal. But we spend so much time investing in money. Investing in things that are not eternal. Paul says, listen, I need you to invest in something that's eternal. Thus he explains for us the durability of love. So we have the drive of love. We have the definition of of love. We have the durability of love. And finally, he closes out the chapter in verse 13 with the distinction of love. And he lists it in a list of some very popular concepts for us. Look at verse 13. He says, So now faith, hope, and love exist or abide. These last. But the greatest, the distinction, right? There's a distinction there. But the greatest of these is love. Faith lasts till when? How long does faith last? Until the second coming of Christ, until we see it ourselves, right? Faith lasts until the second coming of Christ. Hope 
lasts until our reward is realized. I took that straight out of Dan's book. That's why it sounded so sophisticated. It's like, that's not Dustin's language. But that's what hope is, right? Hope only lasts to win. Our reward is realized. Because once our reward of heaven is realized, we've received what? Our hope. I love how Paul puts it when he talks about in, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, when he says, I have fought the good fight, I have kept the faith, I have finished the race, therefore there is a crown of righteousness laid by in store for me. What's Paul's hope? The crown of righteousness. And the hope ends when Paul receives what? His crown of righteousness. He says, not only for me, but for all those who long for or who hope for his appearing. So our faith lasts until when? Christ comes back and we get to see him. Our hope lasts until our reward is realized. But love is given the distinction of being eternal. You see, <clears throat> if we don't have love, if we don't choose daily, to allow this fruit of the Spirit to overflow out of us, who are we? If we cannot choose unselfish love, we will not be an asset to the kingdom. If we cannot choose this unselfish love, we will never be able to evangelize and bring the gospel to people like we need to. If we don't choose to unselfishly love, the church will cease to grow. But God designed us and he created us in his own image to love. The greatest love is exhibited through our mothers and through Christ. In John chapter 15, I want to read this to close. In John chapter 15, Christ is speaking with his apostles and he's teaching them. And he really exhibits this concept of love to them. He says in verse 9, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. And then he tells them, you are my friends. Love exhibited perfectly in Christ. A love in which should drive us. A love that God defines for us. It's a love that's durable. It will last. And it's love that given a great distinction of the greatest of all. Love is something that we all daily need to strive after, this kind of love. I'm not talking about loving that cheeseburger you're going to have for lunch. I'm talking about every day choosing to love unselfishly. That's defined by God, not by man. In a minute, we're going to have the elders come up and they are going to present the flowers and pray over our new babies. I hope we can learn to love like a mother loves. I hope we can most definitely learn to love like Christ loves. And we can grow the kingdom because of that great love as the fruit overflows out of us as his spirit lives within us. 
If you need to respond to the invitation this morning, that's always open. Maybe you have been thinking about starting a relationship with God. Maybe it's time that you need to start studying about who Christ is and is he your king? Maybe this morning is the time that you need prayers. Your heart's breaking over a sin you have in your life. And it may be separating you from the love of God. Whatever your need may be this morning, there's always an opportunity as we stand and as we sing the song that's been selected.